At 5 p.m. on April 4th, 1968, civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King is killed in Memphis, Tennessee. The news travels fast and soon reaches Indianapolis, where Democratic Senator and presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy is speaking in front of a mostly black crowd. Kennedy decides to break the news himself and improvises what becomes one of the most famous speeches in his entire career. Very, very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens, and that is that. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died. It was an extremely delicate moment where the rage of black people could have exploded into devastation and revolts. For those of you who are black, you can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and a desire for revenge. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend what we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. After the announcement of Dr. King's murder, there were protests and riots in more than 100 cities. But in Indianapolis that night, everything remained quiet. Robert F. Kennedy went on with his campaign across America, bringing his discourse directly to the masses of the poor, the unemployed, and the exploited of every race, color, and religion. Get lunch. Get lunch. You haven't had lunch yet? No. I think that uh, considering we have a gross national product of some $700 billion, and that uh, we spend 70 $5 billion on armaments. Seems that we could be doing more for those who are poor and particularly for our children. People resonated with Kennedy's clear stand against the Vietnam War, which, already in its fourth year, was escalating beyond control. Had more Americans killed there in the last several weeks than any time during the war. And we're now, six months ago, we were talking about bombing Hanoi, and we're concerned about that because we're going to kill civilians. I just think that. Uh, we just have to change our policies, and I would hope that the Democratic Party would recognize that. Only hours after this interview, Robert Kennedy was killed in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. He had just celebrated winning the California primary. Like with his brother John, and with Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy's assassination is shrouded in mystery. Lee Harvey Oswald was never convincing as the lone, mad gunman who killed John Kennedy. James Earl Ray was never convincing as the lone, mad gunman who killed Martin Luther King. And Sirhan Sirhan was never convincing as the lone, mad gunman who killed Robert Kennedy. After celebrating his victory in the ballroom of the ambassador, Kennedy was to appear at a press conference in the colonial room of the hotel, located across the building. To avoid the crowds in the corridors, Kennedy is led through the hotel pantry located behind the stage. Here Kennedy stops to shake hands with a group of hotel workers who want to congratulate him on his victory. This is Kennedy's point of view through the swinging doors and into the pantry. As he stops here, the steam table is ahead. To the right is a large ice machine which makes the passage extremely narrow. Next to Kennedy is his bodyguard, and behind Kennedy is Paul Schrade, a local union leader who has given a major boost to the senator's successful campaign. 
Just as Kennedy is about to move away, an unknown individual works his way through the crowd, aims a gun at him, and opens fire. This is the live recording by reporter Andrew West, who was interviewing Kennedy on his way through the pantry. Mr. Humphreys and his uh, background in you, as far as the delegate votes go, you can get those back to struggle for it. Somebody said, Robert. What? Oh my God. Senator Kennedy has been shot in the head. I am right here. Rayford Johnson has a hold of a man who apparently has fired the shot. He has fired the shot. He still has the gun. The gun is pointed at me right at this moment. I hope they can get the gun out of his hand. <laughs> Be very careful. Get the gun. Get the gun. Get the gun. Stay away from the gun. Stay away from the gun. His hand is frozen. Get his thumb. Get his thumb. Get his thumb. Take a hold of his thumb and break it if you have to. Get his thumb. Okay, now hold on to the guy. Hold on to him. Hold on to him, ladies and gentlemen. They have the gun away from the man. In this shot. They've got the gun. I can't see. I can't see the man. At the end of the shooting, Paul Schrade lays on his back, a bullet hole in the middle of his forehead. I thought I was being electrocuted, but it was my first thought before I had to pass out. Being electrocuted because of wet floors, television, cameras, cables. Around him, four more people are wounded, two of them seriously. All five will eventually survive. In the meantime, Kennedy has fallen backwards, pulled down by the arm by his bodyguard. Under the senator's head, a large pool of blood is beginning to form. Someone in the crowd approaches and puts a rosary in his hands. I gave him a pair of rosary beads, which are from Ireland. I, I got a little frightened to see him looking straight up, but he looked at me. I said, the act of contrition, I'm a Roman Catholic. A Roman Catholic is trained to do this in a case of any serious accident. I said, the act of contrition, slowly and audibly, and he heard it. I'm sure of it. And with that, he took my hand in the rosary beads and tightened. After that, Kennedy loses consciousness. Sirhan is immediately arrested and taken away. The police have to protect Sirhan from the enraged crowd. In the ballroom, the news spreads like wildfire. In only a few minutes, a joyful victory turns into an agonizing tragedy. Kennedy is rushed to a nearby hospital. With the Dallas nightmare still vivid in their minds, many across America spend the night in front of the television. In Los Angeles, which was his California headquarters for the California primary, it was a victory celebration. Senator Kennedy is later moved to a larger hospital, the Good Samaritan, where a full brain surgery is performed. 40 minute operation to remove the bullet in his brain and the bone fragments it caused. But his condition was declared critical from the outset. Three hours ago, the senator at that time was described by his press secretary, Frank Mankiewicz, as being still in extremely critical condition. After lingering between life and death for 24 hours, Kennedy dies without ever regaining consciousness. Senator Robert Francis Kennedy died at 1.44 a.m. today, June 6, 1968. He was uh, 42 years old. Immediately after his arrest, Sirhan claims he has no memory of the assassination. His recollections end abruptly at the bar of the ambassador, where he was having coffee with a girl, and resume only at the police station after the assassination. 
In between, total darkness. Do you remember drinking coffee? I remember being around the coffee. You don't remember anything at all after that? What do you remember? When you got back and after you've had some coffee? Yeah. He was born in Jordan in 1944 and was admitted to the United States as a permanent resident in January of 1957. Sharon's residence is in Pasadena, California. While searching his house, the police find a diary in which Sirhan has repeatedly written, Robert Kennedy must die. His neighbors, however, describe Sirhan as a quiet young man who would never hurt anyone. Describe him as a wonderful boy, an example for anybody. He seemed very quiet, what you might call clean cut. Uh, uh, he, he certainly didn't seem like the kind that would do it. The same police chief appears disconcerted. You know, he hasn't told the family about what he's been up to at all, so we don't know anything more than you do. Yeah. Was he politically oriented at all? Not a bit. Not a bit. This is what's perplexing about it. Months go by, but Sir Han seems unable to recover even the smallest fragment of memory from the assassination. Before the trial begins, both prosecution and defense lawyers put Sirhan through a series of psychiatric tests to make sure he is not lying. But Sirhan's amnesia appears genuine. Sirhan's lack of memory for the murder of Robert Kennedy was genuine, and it was established by both the defense and the prosecution before the trial. Sirhan himself badly wanted to remember what had happened. After all, he was caught with a smoking gun, so he wanted very badly to remember, and he worked hard at it, but he was still unable to come up with any motive or any memory of the crime. When confronted with the pages of his diary, Sirhan recognizes his handwriting, but does not remember writing the words. It's my handwriting, you know, my thoughts, but I don't remember them. They are the writings of a maniac. They're not the writings of me now. One year later, in April 1969, the trial begins. But the verdict, as with Lee Harvey Oswald, has already been decided. Sir Han's court-appointed lawyer chooses not to confront the evidence. He presumes that Sirhan is guilty and presents an insanity defense. The Sirhan defense team decided that he was guilty, that the evidence was overwhelming and they would not contest or confront the evidence. Sirhan disagrees. He wants all aspects of the assassination to be debated so he can finally understand what happened. But he is not allowed to take the stand nor to fire his attorney. One day when my son was really, really upset, he was hurt and he couldn't stand it. He said, I, you're, he stood in the courtroom and he said, please, your honor, I have to say something. I don't want these lawyers to defend me because he knew that they are not defending him right. And you know, even the judge, he was so hard. I am so sorry to say this, but he said, look here, fellow, you have to sit down and keep quiet or else I put a mask on your face and I tie you in your chair so you cannot defend yourself. The evidence against Sirhan is overwhelming. LAPD ballistic expert Dwayne Wolfer has traced the bullets that killed Kennedy to Sirhan's handgun. At least 10 people saw him shooting at Kennedy and the diary found in his house confirms his willingness to kill. With a unanimous decision, Sirhan is sentenced to the gas chamber. His sentence is later commuted to life in prison when California abolishes the death penalty. The case is closed. But to some people, things just don't add up. In the wake of the assassination, independent researcher Theodore Chirac and other concerned citizens have collected evidence that casts serious doubt on the official story. This body of evidence strongly suggests both the presence of a second shooter in the pantry and a subsequent cover-up of this fact by the Los Angeles Police Department. But just as the Warren Commission discarded any testimony that would disprove that Oswald acted alone, the judge in Sir Han's trial threw out any evidence contradicting the lone gunman theory. Lone nutcases have always been the best way to explain away and distract attention from much more intricate conspiracies. 
The first problem with the official version is the actual number of bullets that were fired during the assassination. Two bullets were extracted from Kennedy's body. A third went through his chest from side to side. A fourth pierced his jacket without touching his body and proceeded into the ceiling right above the senator. From the five wounded people, one bullet each was extracted. Two more bullets were found embedded in the door jamb between the swinging doors right behind Kennedy. That brings the total of bullets fired to a minimum of 11. But Sir Han's gun, an Ivor Johnson 22 caliber, could only contain eight bullets. There are at least three bullets too many for Sir Han to have acted alone. Despite this, the Los Angeles police officially stated that only eight bullets were fired in the pantry. This allowed the prosecution to maintain that Sir Han acted alone without having to introduce the presence of a second shooter in the pantry. The Warren Commission had to come up with the magic bullet in order to explain John F. Kennedy's assassination with only three shots. The LAPD needed to come up with three similar bullets, all performing magical acrobatics in order to explain this Kennedy's assassination with only eight shots. Really James Day Eugenio wrote the book Assassinations, in which Robert Kennedy's murder is analyzed down to minute detail. They had to do some very interesting things with bullets. They had to have, for example, the bullet that goes through RFK's jacket, and I'm pointing in the direction where it's supposed to hit. Now, it's supposed to go this way. Yeah. Okay? Because he's hit from behind. Uh-uh. This bullet then has to go backwards to hit Paul Schrade going upward at an upward angle. Okay. For that bullet to hit Schrade, Sirhan needed to be much lower than Kennedy. The senator would have had to turn his shoulders to him, and Schrade would have had to be standing practically above him. Then you have bullets going off the ceiling, okay, going downward, but they then bounce upward to hit a woman who's bending over, okay, in the forehead. <laughs> Okay, there's three bullets in this case that do the magic bullet stuff that we know about from the John F. Kennedy case. Even though the eight bullet theory was clearly unsustainable, Sir Han's attorney chose not to challenge it. Thus, the jury was never aware that at least 11 bullets had been fired. In 1968, Stanislaw Przinsky was a young radio reporter who had just finished recording Kennedy's speech at the Ambassador Hotel. You see this slim guy? That's me. And, um, After packing his gear, Przinsky headed for the kitchen, through the pantry, to follow Kennedy and into the press conference. You can see me there, detaching the microphone. It was In a hurry, Przinsky forgot to turn off his cassette recorder. You can see it in my left. I'm leaning down, picking up the tape recorder. I was just following Robert Kennedy and the crowd. I suddenly heard a cry. This is how Przinsky unknowingly recorded the sounds of the entire shooting, which started as he was approaching the pantry. So. Only later did Przinsky realize he had recorded the entire assassination. He immediately turned in the tape to the FBI for analysis. But a tape didn't reveal anything particular, just the yells and screams of the bystanders. However, using the most recent digital technologies, sound and forensic expert Philip von Prague was able to analyze that tape and draw some interesting conclusions. Well, there were 13 shot sounds that uh, I found on that recording, uh, up to the point where the screams just totally overrode all of the other audio. The original recording by Przinsky reveals two separate shots at the beginning, the first of which is clearly audible, followed by a quick series of back-to-back -back shots. This confirms the reports by several witnesses who said they heard one or two shots, a pause, and then pandemonium.
The Krasinski recording was later analyzed by a second laboratory, independent from von Prague. So definitely there's two shots here. Bang, bang, bang. Mm -hmm. It's the first shot, but, uh, 360. 360. Oh, 360. We have one, two, three, maybe, four, five, six, maybe, seven, eight, nine. There, there's a lot of shots potentially here. The tape was also sent to a third laboratory in Denmark, which returned a similar result. So he felt there was 10 different places where it looked like there were shots. So we're getting very similar results. As Von Prague explains, it is impossible to establish the exact number of shots fired. But everyone seems to agree that there were at least nine or ten, if not even more. I cannot absolutely guarantee that 13 is the correct number. However, it is greater than eight, I can certainly say that. Now, within the 13 captured shot sounds, there are a couple of instances of what I call double shots, and that is two shots that occur so closely together such that they couldn't really have come from a single weapon. This confirms some eyewitness reports that had been circulating immediately after the shooting. One witness said that those shots came so close together that he could scarcely believe they were fired from one gun. A reporter heard the shots from an adjoining room, said they sounded almost like they came from a machine gun. Uh, so short was the burst of fire. As Kennedy concluded his speech, Sandra Serrano, a campaign assistant, went out to get some fresh air on the fire escape of the hotel. After a few minutes, she saw an excited young couple rush down the stairs. I was standing there just thinking, you know, thinking about how many people there were and how wonderful it was. And then this girl came running down the stairs in the back, came running down the stairs and said, we've shot him, we've shot him. And I said, who did you shoot? And she says, we shot Senator Kennedy. She had on a white dress with polka dots. She was light-skinned, dark hair. The same exchange was heard by two bystanders, the Bernsteins, who later reported it to Detective Shiraga, who was collecting information on the murder. I asked them what had happened, and uh, the woman related that her and her husband were outside the embassy room when a young couple in their late teens or early 20s, a girl wearing a polka dot dress, came running by them shouting, we shot him, we shot him, we killed him. And the older woman asked, who did you shoot? And uh, the young woman said, uh, Kennedy, we shot him, we killed him. And then the two of them ran off just real happy, real joyful. Realtor George Green and journalist Booker Griffin were not together at the Ambassador Hotel, but they tell the same story. I saw uh, Sir Han and a lady and another gentleman consistently throughout the evening. Uh, there was a girl in a, in, a, in a black and white dress involved uh, with Sir Han. She was tall, statuesque, black hair, well built. I did notice that. Uh, I remember that she had on a polka dot dress. Investigative journalist Fernando Fora recalls the content of the tape he gave to the police. The man that I interviewed on that tape was named John Fehi. He claims to have spent the day with a girl who later became known as the girl in the polka dot dress. This girl predicted the killing of Senator Kennedy not only as to the date, but to the exact occasion on which it would occur. The polka dot girl has never been found. Even though the list of witnesses who saw her was very conspicuous, the LAPD chose not to pursue this lead. What they did instead was to call in Sandra Serrano for questioning and tried everything possible to make her change her testimony. I've seen those people. No, 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 Sandy. I don't know what I told you about that. You can't say you saw something from what well, I see. It. There was this girl coming. She was coming downstairs and she said, We shot, we shot. Okay. No, this girl on the polka dot dress, a white dress. Oh, God. Yeah. And I, Don't you suck at it, I know what I'm telling you. I know what I'm telling you. It, it, it said I've never even seen a girl with, like, with a polka dot dress. I've seen that. Nobody told you we had shot Kennedy. Yes, somebody told me that we had shot Kennedy. No. I'm sorry, but that's true. That is true. But well, number one, do you know that nobody told you we had shot Kennedy? No, somebody told me we had shot Kennedy. No, that's nobody true. told you. Where did he tell you this, Sandy? Outside. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. 
After many hours of harassment and threats, Sandra Serrano finally broke down and told the LAPD she wasn't so sure of what she had seen and heard on the stairs of the ambassador. In the meantime, Detective Shiraga found out that the sentence from his report on the polka dot girl, we shot him, had been changed to read, they shot him. So apparently they thought that uh, the reports would not be scrutinized or sub subject to scrutiny. What they didn't count on, I guess, was the fact that I kept one of the reports myself, the original stencil copy. This is how another important piece of evidence, which clearly suggests a conspiracy, never was read into the official evidence at trial. Even though Sandra Serrano was forced to recant to the police, in private, she has never changed her version of the facts. So what happened? They said, we shot him, we shot him. I said, you shot who? And they said, the senator. In 1968, Scott Enyart was a 15-year-old student who dreamt of becoming a famous international photographer. After obtaining false credentials from a friend, Enyart managed to insinuate himself into the press corps covering Kennedy's speech. A friend of ours got past us. We thought, you know, it would be fun. We could get some pictures. So that's why we came. How long have you worked with a professional camera, Scott? I had been using a camera for about two years prior to what happened here. Standing right in front of the podium, Enyart unknowingly took some of the last pictures of Robert Kennedy alive. After the senator completed his speech, Enyart followed him through the hotel pantry. I was about five feet from the podium. As he finished his speech, I followed him into the pantry area. Uh, as I got into the pantry, I was about ten feet behind him, continuing to take pictures as he shook hands with people. Uh, and all of a sudden, I saw him drop from the frame. He fell. And I continued taking pictures. I backed up. I jumped up on a table. Everyone in front of me had been shot and fell. And I jumped up to get out of the way. I continued taking pictures for a while. Once outside the hotel, Scott Enyart found himself surrounded by a group of policemen who arrested him. As soon as I got out the door, I was surrounded by about six policemen with their guns drawn. And uh, they placed me in a car, took my camera from me, and told me that it was evidence and that uh, they would have to have the film. They finally questioned me around 5.30, gave my camera back without the film. And I asked them about when I would get my film back, and they told me that they'd contact me. After the trial, the police returned to Scott some of his pictures, but not all of them. These are the prints the police gave you after the trial, the third hand trial? That's correct. I feel there are some missing from it. I, I took a 36 exposure roll, and I got 26 prints back. He received both the pictures he had shot before the assassination, and those he shot right after. But the ones he shot during the assassination were all missing. They didn't contact me, and about six months later, I started asking, you know. I called them, went down there, and asked them about, you know, having the rights to my own film. And they disavowed any knowledge of even knowing me. Enyart went back to the police and asked for the remaining pictures, but was told that they had been classified, and that he would have to wait 20 years to get them back. Scott patiently waited for 20 years, but when he finally showed up to get his pictures back, he found out that they had been destroyed before Sirhan's trial. I was notified by the California State Archives that my photographs, along with 2,400 other pieces of evidence, had been destroyed by the LAPD three weeks before Sirhan's trial. During the assassination, Scott Enyart was standing behind Kennedy and his bodyguard. His missing shots likely revealed everything that transpired. Right after the shooting, different people noticed the bullet holes in the door jamb behind Kennedy and in the ceiling panels above him. After the FBI took pictures of the door jamb, the LAPD removed it, together with the ceiling panels, as evidence. But these elements were never introduced at the trial. After the trial ended, the Los Angeles police chose to incinerate them. This is the explanation by the chief of police, Daryl Gates, for such a disturbing choice. We kept them around for a long, long time, uh, and we finally said, this case has gone to court. The man has been convicted. You, you can't keep junk around forever. And they took up a lot of room. 
Robert Kennedy's assassination remains one of the most important homicides in modern history. It's difficult to believe that the Los Angeles police, which is normally very meticulous, could not find room for a couple pieces of wood. When accused of having intentionally destroyed important evidence, Daryl Gates stated that the door jam and the ceiling panels did not prove anything. Everything that was used to convict Sirhan was preserved. Those things that had no evidentiary value, uh, those are the, some of the things that were destroyed. In fact, the two bullets in the door jam would bring the total number of shots fired to 11, thus establishing, without a doubt, the presence of a second shooter in the pantry. This would have meant that Kennedy was killed as the result of a conspiracy, not by the action of a lone assassin. The inexcusable behavior of the Los Angeles Police Department was also denounced by the Chief of the State Archives of California. As the documents show, the police did dispose of physical evidence, the door jams and ceiling tiles from the crime scene. Among missing photographic items are those relating directly to crime scene studies, ballistics examinations, and witness reenactments. But the evidence of a cover-up does not stop here. A few years after the trial, someone discovered that the serial number written on the envelope that contained Sir Han's gun did not match the one on the gun itself. In other words, the ballistic tests that traced the bullets to Sir Han's handgun had been actually performed by Dwayne Wolfer on a different weapon. Dwayne Wolfer, the criminals for the LAPD crime lab, had drawn the conclusion that the bullets recovered were fired from Saran's gun. And it turned out that he examined a gun that had a different serial number than Saran. Again, the Los Angeles police tried to justify the mismatch as a simple transcription error. But the list of negligent errors, omissions, and procedural violations is so long at this point, it becomes extremely difficult to believe they were all just mistakes. This investigation wasn't botched, it was deliberately covered up. They didn't botch a few things, their behavior was uh, scandalous. The most cumbersome piece of evidence against the official version remains Robert Kennedy's autopsy, performed by Los Angeles coroner Thomas Noguchi. Among the best in his profession, Noguchi was known as the coroner of the stars. Having performed the autopsies on such famous people as Marilyn Monroe, Janis Joplin, John Belushi, actress Sharon Tate, and Roberto Calvi, the Italian banker connected with the Vatican banking scandal, found dead under a London bridge. In Kennedy's autopsy, Noguchi found that all the bullets that hit him traveled from below to above and originated from behind the senator at his right-hand side, while Sirhan, as reported by all witnesses, was always standing in front of Kennedy. Noguchi also established that the fatal shot to the head was fired at close range, from a few inches at most. One a gunshot wound was found behind the right ear and uh, it showed the direction to be uh, upward, uh, back to a front, and uh, of course to the right to uh, left direction. So if I may just uh, use my finger to illustrate, it will be uh, like this. There were abundance of a powder a deposit on the edge of the uh, right ear and uh, after testifying at the similar weapon we came to conclusion that the muzzle distance would be a, a uh, one inch from the right ear edge and no more than three inches but Sir Han, as reported by all witnesses, never got closer than three feet from Kennedy. He was not an inch away from Kennedy's head because he was across the room on this ice thing. And the room, I don't know the dimensions of the room, but he was not an inch away. The closest anybody ever put the gun who saw the gun at all was 18 inches. Most people put it three, four, five, six feet away. The key here is that nobody is saying that that gun went right up against Kennedy's ear and fired the fatal shot. They all have varying discrepancies of distance. We are too far away to create the powder burns discovered by Horner and Noguchi. 
Noguchi also found that the other two shots that hit Kennedy originated from behind and from below. There were uh, two additional gunshot wounds found in the senator's uh, uh, remains. The two were very close together. Gunshot wound number two was uh, found in the armpit, and it was a through and through gunshot wound, and the direction was uh, back to uh, front. And uh, the exit wound was found uh, uh, front of the right shoulder. We thus have three shots originating from a different position than Sirhan's. Three shots from a much closer distance than where Sirhan was standing. But again, the jury was never made aware of the important details in Dr. Noguchi's autopsy. At the trial, Dr. Noguchi never had the opportunity to elaborate on his astounding findings. His testimony was cut short. In fact, soon after, Dr. Noguchi was fired and accused of being derelict in his performance of the Robert Kennedy autopsy. Despite the hostility that Dr. Noguchi had to face, he never changed a single word from his original report. There were three gunshot wounds. The fatal gunshot wound was found at the right side of the back of the head, just behind this uh, right ear. The distance between the head to the gun was no more than three inches away. That bullet which killed Kennedy, it was an inch away from, from his head. This bullet didn't come from, from uh, Sahan. Did not come from Sahan. Because he never got that close. Carl Euchre was the maitre d' at the Ambassador Hotel. At the end of Kennedy's speech, he grabbed the senator by the wrist and led him away from the crowd. In the pantry, Sir Han appeared and started to shoot. Euchre let go of Kennedy's arm and threw himself against Sir Han, pushing him against the metal table. More people dove on Sir Han to help Euchre grab the gun. In the center of this picture is Carl Euchre. Below him is Sir Han. At this moment, Kennedy has fallen backwards to the floor, behind the people to the right of the picture. I, I'm leading uh, Senator Kennedy, uh, more or less holding him on his uh, ankle, like this, leading him towards the kitchen, which leads towards the co colonial room. And uh, when we came behind the doors, he starts shaking hands with some of the um, helpers and some of the uh, hotel staff. And so I took Senator Kennedy's uh, hand again and said, Senator, we have to go. And uh, the Senator's guess, hand was back in your hand, Carl. Yeah, his right hand, I got with my left hand. Mm -hmm. It's like this. Mm -hmm. I got his hand right here and saying, I said, Senator, we have to go now. But this time he was still talking towards the uh, busboy and, and he starts looking at me and we start going. At the same time was when the, uh, somebody moved into me between the the uh, steam table mm -hmm. and myself you no know, i was maybe it was one foot in between the, st the steam table and myself at that time i hit one shot and i thought it was a firecracker or something. i had kennedy by the hand and i heard the second shot going off and then i realized i saw that gun here somewhere around here you know somewhere around there and i guess at the time when i lose kennedy's hand and i guess dropped his hand and i I was very lucky that I got him right here on his ankle. No, that, that was my luck, otherwise I wouldn't be here today anymore. So I pushed him down and I put him over the steam table, and here Shahan keeps on pulling him to, to the left side, and that's when he is, starts shooting very rapidly. The last shots, you know. That time I had him like this, you know, and I was hitting that, that, that gun on top of the steam Get table. Get hold of his thumb and break it if you have to. Get his thumb. Okay, now hold on to the guy. Hold on to him. Hold on to him, ladies and gentlemen. They have the gun away from the man. Was it possible for Sir Han to get behind you and behind Senator Kennedy and shoot from behind? No, you? this was uh, complete impossible because Sir Han was in front of me and he, he didn't have no way to go behind me, to come behind me, to shoot from behind me. I had him right in front of me. I didn't let him pass me. I had my left foot on his knees, and I pushed him over. And, uh, the well, time, uh, Sir Han then was shooting blindly after the second shot. Oh, yes, blindly, yes. 
Yes. He just was uh, pulling the trigger, even could feel when, when his hand was moving and pulling him, but he didn't see anything anymore where he was shooting because I had, had him complete covered with my, uh, you know. If Sirhan didn't fire the fatal shots, then who did? Next to Kennedy on the right was Eugene Thane Caesar, a last minute replacement after the senator's regular bodyguard was suddenly unable to show up for work that evening. Caesar said that he had pulled his gun during the shooting, but was unable to fire a shot. And I was a little behind Bobby, so I would say I was about three feet from the flash, because I looked up and seen a red gun flash. And, uh, and like I said, I got a little bit of powder in my eyes. When the shots were fired, when I reached for my gun, and this one I got knocked down. Did you get your gun out of your holster? Yeah, but it didn't do no good because I'm on the floor. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. There is someone, however, who says that Caesar did fire, and more than once. I was in the uh, pantry way following the senator. He stopped and shook hands with several people and started to progress again. We were packed in there like sardines. There were lights and cameras and people and a lot of excitement. Don Schulman was a young television reporter covering Kennedy's campaign. As we were slowly pushed forward, another man stepped out and he shot. Just then the guard who was standing behind Kennedy took out his gun and he fired also. The next thing I knew is that Kennedy was shot three times. Now how far was Sir Han uh, from Senator Kennedy at the time? I would say approximately from three to six feet. Where was this guard who was firing his gun? He was standing directly to the side and back of Kennedy. On what side? He was standing on the right-hand side. Now, Don, did you tell this story to uh, any police authorities? I told the story to several different people, in including several police authorities. When right. Shulman tried to tell his story to the police, they refused to listen. In fact, I also told them that the guard pulled out the gun, and everyone told me that in the confusion I... I, I didn't see what I saw. Well, I didn't see everything that happened that night mm -hmm. because of the blinding lights and the people screaming, but the things that I did see, I'm sure about, and that is Kennedy being shot three times. The guard definitely pulled out his gun and fired. Once again, the Los Angeles police did not follow normal procedures. They did not confiscate Caesar's gun and did not look for other possible weapons in the pantry. In this picture, taken right after the assassination, Caesar shows all his bullets still in his hand. But his ordnance gun was a 38 caliber, while Kennedy was killed with a 22 caliber. It was later found that Caesar also owned a 22 caliber, which no one has ever been able to find. Initially, Caesar said he had sold the 22 before the assassination, but evidence emerged later that Caesar had sold it three months after the assassination. Strangely enough, Caesar requested not to be called to testify. What was really surprising is that the court granted his wish. Shortly afterwards, Caesar disappeared from sight and went to live in the Philippines. Many people today are convinced that he is the one who shot Kennedy at close range, as he was pulling the senator to the ground while everyone's attention was concentrated on Sir Han. I found this in the files recently that Various parts of the hotel were guarded by different guards. Faye and Eugene Caesar was one of several guards hired by the hotel through a security. A security had like eight or ten guys there that night. And different guards were being very good at their posts and checking people's ID and only letting certain people in. But for whatever reason, the kitchen was constantly unguarded. And one of the Kennedy staffers is complaining to the police in the files about how she had to keep shooing people out of the kitchen. No one was supposed to be there except press people you know, or, you know, certainly Robert Kennedy and his immediate, you know, attendance. Uh, but the person who was charged with guarding the kitchen door was St. Eugene Caesar. <laughs> so, I mean, if, if you wanted to have a guy, you know, in there to make sure Sirhan got into the room, because, frankly, if your patsy doesn't get in the pantry, the whole plot is off, right? You know, you got to get him into the pantry, and the only way to do that is to make sure whoever's guarding the room is going to let him in. It would be the ultimate paradox if the person shown in this picture arresting the presumed killer were in fact the one responsible for the murder. At the end of the day, one major mystery still lingers over Robert Kennedy's assassination. 
Sirhan Sirhan, today aging in a California prison, still does not remember a single moment from the assassination. I asked him, I said, son, will you tell me why did you do that? His tears began to drop. He said, mama, I'm sorry. I don't remember anything. I was told that I killed Senator Robert Kennedy. After 15 years of analyzing the evidence and interviewing experts and witnesses, the only logical conclusion in this case, from my mind, is that Sirhan Sirhan was a programmed assassin, programmed to show up shooting at Robert Kennedy, and programmed not to remember. In the 1962 film, The Manchurian Candidate, a man commits a series of murders of which he later has no memory whatsoever. Why did you try to kill me? I had to kill him. I had to. It is later revealed that the assassin had been programmed to kill and then to forget to have killed through hypnosis. Listen, Corporal Williams. I've got it, Watson. I've got it. Got what? The method used in the finger murders. Well, what is it? Hypnotism, my dear fellow. Hypnotism. This is obviously just a movie, but we do know that it is possible, through hypnosis, to erase entire blocks of memory. Oh, that's the door. Dormi profondamente. E tutto quello che hai visto si cancella nei suoi effetti dalla tua mente. Il tuo sonno è sempre più profondo. E il sonno che tu dormi this hypnosis session is from the notorious case of Fortunato Zanfretta, an Italian security guard who claimed to have been abducted by aliens. Quando io ti risveglierò, tu non saprai nulla di quello che è accaduto nelle ultime ore e non ricorderai nulla. <coughs> As one can see, by the end of the session, the subject has absolutely no memory of what has happened. Tutto okay, eh? He even shows to have lost his sense of time. Definito. <laughs> the entire period spent under hypnosis, to him, simply does not exist. But is it possible to program a person to perform an action, like a homicide, which is against his will and moral principles? Dr. Spiegel, a famous psychiatrist, is also one of the foremost experts in hypnosis worldwide. The total and complete amnesia that Sir Han demonstrated uh, from the very beginning to this very day suggests strongly that he was A, highly hypnotizable, and B, uh, programmed uh, to perform that act. Bernard Diamond. Um, placed him under hypnosis and discovered that this was very easy. He simply held up a quarter in front of Sir Han's face and Sir Han went right into a trance, indicating to Dr. Diamond that Sir Han was an excellent subject and had been programmed before and was experienced with hypnosis. Dr. Diamond testified that under hypnosis, Sir Han was able to easily replicate all the passages in his diary. Sir Han was asked, uh, under, under hypnosis, tell us more about Robert Kennedy. And he responded R by writing out similar phrases, RFK must die, die, RFK must die, die. Dr. Diamond concluded that Sirhan wrote his diary in a hypnotic trance. In 1970, America was shocked to learn that for over 15 years, the CIA had run a secret program called MK Ultra. Their intent was to manipulate the human mind, to make an individual perform whatever action he was told. In 1954, the four years before the Manchurian Candidate novel had been uh, published, the Central Intelligence Agency had a team to build Manchurian candidates to commit assassination. The experiments took place in Montreal, in the Allen Memorial Clinic of Dr. Cameron, a renowned Canadian psychiatrist. This eerie, foreboding structure also known as Raven's Crack, became a house of psychological horrors. Using unknowing Canadian citizens as test subjects, Cameron had developed a new procedure which caught the eye of the MK Ultra researchers, as well as the Canadian intelligence community. He was hired by the CIA and the Canadian government to further explore the treatment, which he called psychic driving. 
First, Cameron proposed that they would use intensive electroshock and LSD and other disorienting drugs to, in his terms, depattern individuals, basically to wipe the slate clean. Second, using tape-recorded messages, try to program in new behaviors by repeating these messages hundreds of thousands of times while the victim was immobilized with other drugs. And uh, the final phase was to try to wipe the slate clean so that people could not, again, remember what had happened to them but still have the new behavior. The psychic driving experiments literally reduced the person to a vegetable. Linda McDonald was one of those patients. I think there were about 80 of us. We discovered that these 80 people were just ordinary, everyday people. It could have been you, it could have been me, it was me. It could have been anybody who just walked through the doors of the Allen Memorial on the wrong day at the wrong time when Dr. Cameron needed another schizophrenic for his fun little stuff upstairs. Linda McDonald started off as a pretty much normal person. She basically came into the hospital as a mother with many young children who was a little overwhelmed and depressed for just routine psychiatric treatment. And three weeks after I was there, I was shipped up to the sleep ward. And I came out of there a vegetable five months later. By the time someone was in the sleep room, the ability of that individual to remember or describe what happened to them was very limited. So the descriptions that there are are from nurses and from other people who worked at the facility, and their descriptions are, uh, to quote one, like something out of Dante's Inferno. I received a, a total of 109 electroconvulsive shock treatments. In less than five weeks, I had 86 straight comatose days where I was uh, completely out of it. The purpose for all of this was to wipe from my memory, to take a life, to wipe it completely clean. So I would not have a memory ever. When I came out uh, of the treatment and they had decided that I, my memory was wiped sufficiently, I didn't know who I was. I was a baby. I, I, they had to toilet train me and they had to teach me to walk and talk and feed myself. She has absolutely zero direct memory of her life before age 25. Now, it doesn't take long to figure out why the CIA or other intelligence agencies would be interested in such research. Well, if Cameron can get it for, to work for a psychiatric patient, well, then they can use the same thing to, to deprogram somebody and put them back together for brainwashing. After a long and painful struggle, during which she lost the custody of her children, Linda McDonald finally discovered the truth. This big headline saying, Dr. Cameron, uh, CIA, brainwashing experiments, and I stopped breathing for a minute. Um, you could have knocked me over. I couldn't, I knew Dr. Cameron was my doctor. I knew I had been at the Allen Memorial. But up until that moment, I believed, because that's what I was told, that the doctor had fixed me, had done to me great things and I was lucky that he had been my doctor so I couldn't I couldn't not read the article and as I read it I became I was just horrified a normally conditioned American who's been trained to kill and then to have no memory of having killed without memory of his deed we cannot possibly feel guilt nor will he of course have any reason to fear being caught I wanted a killer from a world filled with killers, and they chose you. His tears began to drop. He said, Mama, I'm sorry. I don't remember anything. I was told that I killed Senator Robert Kennedy. In fact, for a three-month period prior to the assassination, Sir Han completely disappeared from sight. No one has ever been able to account for this missing time, including Sirhan himself. The MK Ultra program was immediately dismantled, but Robert Kennedy's assassination took place at the height of CIA experiments into mental manipulation. Could Sirhan have been the victim of this secret mind control program? We may never know who wanted Robert Kennedy killed. 
In view of all this evidence, however, we can safely state that it was not Sir Han who assassinated the young senator on the way to a presidency that could have radically changed the course of history in the last 40 years. are black and white, rich and poor, young and old. What has violence ever accomplished? What has it ever created? No martyr's cause has ever been stilled by an assassin's bullet. No wrongs have ever been righted by riots and civil disorders. The sniper is only a coward, not a hero. And an uncontrolled or uncontrollable mob is only the voice of madness, not the voice of the people. Whenever any American's life is taken by another American unnecessarily, whenever we tear at the fabric of our lives, which another man has painfully and clumsily woven for himself and his children, whenever we do this, then the whole nation is degraded. Yet we seemingly tolerate a rising level of violence that ignores our common humanity and our claims to civilization alike. We calmly accept newspaper reports of civilian slaughter in far off lands. We glorify killing on movie and television screens and we call it entertainment. Too often we excuse those who are willing to build their own lives on the shattered dreams of other human beings. For there is another kind of violence, slower but just as deadly destructive as the shot or the bomb in the night. This is the violence of institutions, indifference, inaction and decay. This is the violence that afflicts the poor, that poisons relations between men because their skin has different colors. This is the slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books and homes without heat in the winter. This is the breaking of a man's spirit by denying him the chance to stand as a father and as a man amongst other men. And this too afflicts us all. For when you teach a man to hate and to fear his brother, when you teach that he is a lesser man because of his color or his beliefs or the policies that he pursues, when you teach that those who differ from you threaten your freedom or your job or your home or your family, then you also learn to confront others, not as fellow citizens, but as enemies, to be met not with cooperation, but with conquest, to be subjugated and to be mastered. We learn at the last to look at our brothers as aliens alien men with whom we share a city, but not a community. Men bound to us in common dwelling, but not in a common effort. We learn to share only a common fear, only a common desire to retreat from each other, only a common impulse to meet disagreement with force. We must admit the vanity of our false distinctions, the false distinctions among men. 
and learn to find our own advancement and search for the advancement of all. We must admit to ourselves that our children's future cannot be built on the misfortune of another's. Our lives on this planet are too short. The work to be done is too great to let this spirit flourish any longer in this land of ours. Of course, we cannot banish it with a program, nor with a resolution. But we can perhaps remember, if only for a time, that those who live with us are our brothers, that they share with us the same short moment of life, that they seek, as do we, nothing but the chance to live out their lives in purpose and in happiness, winning what satisfaction and fulfillment that they can. Too much and for too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community value in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage it counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and it counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the police to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifle and Specs knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud that we are Americans. And whether we're willing to say candor of an American officer at Ben Trey in, in Vietnam, that it may, became necessary to destroy this town, in order to save it. Now, he wasn't saying that just for himself. He was saying it also for you. And he was saying it for the American people. And what is our responsibility? And therefore, what should be our policy in dealing with problems like that? These are moral problems. They're security problems. They're problems for all of you, for all of us as United States citizens. must help in all of these complex questions because you will bear the burdens of errors or misjudgment. President Kennedy once said, and I think very true, that you, the younger generation, you have the least ties to the past and the greatest stake in the future. So what happens in the decisions that we make are going to have the greatest stake on your lives, the greatest effect on your lives. We might be the government officials that carry out policy, or we might be the ones that implement it, or we might be the ones that begin it or stimulate it. But in the last analysis, the people that are this policy is going to have the greatest effect on is going to be all of you. The question of what uh, kind of lives we're going to lead, the quality of life that's going to exist in the United States, whether there are going to be endless divisions between blacks and whites, between various age groups on our foreign policy, the quality of life, that's going to be really have the, or even whether there's going to be life itself. That's going to be, these are the questions that are being decided and these seems to me have the greatest effect on you more than any other generation. We have made mistakes in the past. 
as I've said before, I was involved in mistakes. There were mistakes made during the administration of President Kennedy, undoubtedly mistakes that were made regarding Vietnam, of which I was intimately involved. But what I hope is that we look to the past. We look to the past and we see where we've erred and where we've done right, and we benefit by the mistakes that we have made. And that's what I think that we can do here in the United States of America. What will, in fact, be our policy after Vietnam? What should it be? These are the hardest of issues, and there are no easy answers, really, to any of them. But if we are to make the right choice, it seems to me that we must confront these issues openly and honestly. I think the Democratic Party has accomplished a great deal over the period of the last seven years. I think that we've done a great deal here in the United States, and I think that we've done much which we can be proud in our relationship with other countries. I think we've made mistakes, but it seems to me that the Democratic Party that's going to get elected, and, if, and the way I run is that uh, we have to look, not just talk about what we've done in the past, not just talk about what we've accomplished in the past, but people want to know what we're going to do in the future, what we think the situation is at the moment, and what we intend to do to bring peace around the world and bring prosperity and happiness and to our own people here at home. It's on that basis that I run for President of the United States, and on that, on that basis that I ask for your support. It seems to me that particularly college students, but all of us in the United States, and especially in such a critical year as 1968, which is going to determine the future and the destiny, of so many people, not only in the United States, but all over the globe. And this is the year in which people can decide, not 1969 or 1970, it's the year 1968, which is going to determine the direction that the United States is going to move, what kind of leadership we're going to have. It seems to me that we have to have the spirit that uh, Plato reported, that all things are to be examined and brought into question, that there is no limit set to thought. And that's what I think, that's the spirit that we need on a university campus, and that's the spirit, really, that we need in this election year of 1968, to examine everything, not take anything for granted, to examine everything and see where we are, as Abraham Lincoln said in, in 1858, where we are. Only when we know where we are will we know where we can go and how we can get there. We must look carefully and honestly at our policies abroad. We must examine how we can help the millions of our fellow citizens who lead lives of hopelessness and poverty, as Sophocles said, where day follows day, with death the only goal. What joy is there in day that follows day, with death the only goal? We must, must decide what moral obligations we have to the other peoples in the globe, peoples of Latin America, and some of the villages that I visited, and I'm sure that some of you have visited, where seven out of 10 children die before their first birthday, that the average person who dies in Latin America is under the age of four. That uh, the starvation and the difficulty and the hopelessness that face those people. About the men in Asia who have less to eat now than they did at the start of the decade. About those in Africa whose every living moment is filled with disease. For those who know only suffering and deprivation where we lead relative lives of comfort and of happiness where each year, at the some time that, that all of this is going on all over the globe, each year we in the United States spend $3 billion on pets, almost $2 billion on dogs, and yet uh, all of the starvation and all of the suffering takes place all over the rest of the globe. These men and women and children that we hear about and which I'm talking about now, they're not statistics. They are human beings that I have seen and I think that many of you have seen, each with a right to lead a life of dignity and purpose, just as much as you and I have. We happen to be fortunate enough to be born in the United States of America. We have to be, happen to be fortunate enough to be able to attend a high school and then go on to a university. But what, make, what did we do in our lives that gives us that right instead of being born in Northeast Brazil and not even living to your first birthday? 
or being born in East Africa or Tanzania and where 97% of the people are illiterate. What did we ever do? What did we ever contribute? And what can we ever say that we ever did? What really is our purpose in life? When it finally comes down to it, that we could be, very, that we could be born with all of these advantages that we enjoy here in the United States, and they, 70, 80% of the rest of the world, suffer as much as they do. And when you finally decide that, then you must also decide what we can do to make up for, for all of the advantages that we have. Don't we have a major responsibility to those that do not have those advantages? Don't we have a major responsibility, not the government of the United States, but we as individuals have a major responsibility and obligation to those who don't have the advantages that we do. Do they know about Martin Luther King? We have uh, wrapped up the only that can be handled in the Could you lower those signs, please? I have some very sad news for all of you, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence evidently is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country and greater polarization black people amongst blacks and white amongst whites filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand and compassion and love. For those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with, be filled with hatred and mistrust of the injustice of such an act against all white people, I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poem, my, my favorite poet was Aeschylus. He once wrote, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget, falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own day despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another, feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. Stay right there before we move. <laughs> Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Back up. Back up.